All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in to the Neil, Neil Cooch Show today. Today I have a wonderful guest by the name of Didier Babette. Didier is a guy I went yep. to school with uh, many, many years ago, but uh, now he's into real estate. So yeah. I thought I'd take the time to have a chat with him about it. But before I get into that, uh, I just want to say thank you very much for coming on to the show, Didier. Neil, that's, that's not a problem at all. I absolutely love what you're doing. I think it's great. I watched a few of your other of your other interviews on YouTube. I like them. I've given you a thumbs up and a subscribe. So keep it going, brother. Thank you very, Absolutely love it. Good thank work. you very much for that. And for everyone out there, don't forget, if you do enjoy this video and my past videos, be sure to subscribe. Hit the notification bell so you can hear about new episodes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, hit us a like or smash a like for me. So um, Didier, tell me a bit about yourself. Well, look, um, I'm I'm actually in Melbourne right now. That's where I live. I uh, didn't originally start out in real estate. Actually, when I first started my career all those many, many years ago, 20 years ago now, I actually uh, did a Bachelor of Business in Marketing and Management. And I ended up working for a large corporate straight out of university on a grad program. So I actually went into Telstra. And very quickly in Telstra, I discovered, hey, you know what? Big corporates aren't for me. I'm not so keen on being a very small part of a big machine. I want to be my own boss. At the time, I had a friend who was in real estate. You know, his day consisted of you know, having coffees, catch up with uh, people at home, catch up with people in cafes. It looked like a great job. And I said, hey, dude, uh, can I become a real estate agent? You know, do you recommend it? He said, no, do not become a real estate agent. It's too much work. And I personally, I said, no, 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 I'm going to come in. I'm going to come see you. I'm coming on Monday. Went in on Monday, had a chat to him, met his boss, and basically just snowballed from there. And now I'm in real estate. I absolutely love what I do. Um, I couldn't imagine doing anything else, obviously, uh, being an agent now. But it has been a long road, has been difficult, but it's been very rewarding as well. So that's a little bit of my, about my professional side, personally. I guess I'm a pretty chilled guy. I think I'm a bit of a people person. I like, I like talking, as you can probably tell. And it just kind of gelled really, really well with the whole real estate because I guess end of the day, real estate is about people, isn't it? Yeah, you know? that's right. So, um, so. You, you got into a large corporation – um, so working for I a did. large telco, I did. was was there a lot of long mm. hours in that? What was it like working? Ooh. Look, at the risk of offending some people out there that work for large corporations, I'm just going to be honest and tell my truth, uh, working for a large company uh, can be a little bit soul-sucking. I'll be honest. You know, you're nothing but a number sometimes if you're one of the unlucky ones that work in these you know, mega huge you know, global companies. Um, you go in, you know, you might spend 20 years or 10 years or whatever it is, you know, giving your heart and soul to this company at the end, end of the day, you're expendable and you're working long hours as well. You know, yes, you're getting at nine, but you're getting up at six Then you're getting on the train. Then you're getting to, to your desk at nine. Then you're finishing at five, five thirty, six, six thirty. who knows another hour on the train home. So for me, it didn't make sense. You know, I didn't want to give my life a big company, um, to walk out of it on the other end with not much for it. I wanted to build a brand. I wanted to. Uh, do my own thing. I want to be to be to be my own boss. And luckily for me, I I found real estate, and that was my ticket to achieving that end. And I have not looked back since. Um, not trying to you know rag on people that that do enjoy that corporate kind of lifestyle, but for someone who's entrepreneur entrepreneurial like myself and a, and a lot of people that I know, it just wasn't for us. Just wasn't for us so at all. what, what yeah. was it, your main motivation into getting into real estate? Was it uh, was your friend living a high yeah. life, or was it mainly just to become your own <laughs> boss? Was was the deal there? <laughs> I'll be honest with you. At first, I thought it was the high life. I thought I'm going to have the high life here. I mean, what's my day going to consist of? Have a coffee and uh, you know go to someone's house, have another coffee, chat for a bit, and bang, I've 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 got a sale. That's what I thought it was going to be. It actually didn't turn out to be like that at all. It's actually a lot of hard work, very, very long hours. But the difference is when you put in those hours, it's for yourself. So that's why I'm happy to, to actually do that. Um, I, I guess what really drove me to get into real estate at the end of the day, apart from all, all of the other stuff, is um, I enjoy dealing with people. You know, I enjoy – I could sit down with you here and talk to you for four hours about something or about nothing at all. We could walk out of here learning something or we, or we could walk out of here not learning anything at all. But the point is I just like to talk because you're a person, I'm a person, and I kind of enjoy that interaction a lot. And that was what really drove me down that path, I think. And you know, if there's anyone out there that's thinking about doing you know, this job or uh, I, if, if you're that kind of person, absolutely get into it. 
it's great. So is it the people yeah. interaction that you enjoy most about real estate, is it? It's, it's the people. It's, it's the people. It's, you, you don't know who you'll meet tomorrow or, you know, this morning to this afternoon. It's so, so varied. You know, you might be dealing with a developer who's all about the numbers and the dollar signs. And then you might segue into meeting a lovely old lady who's lived in this house for 40 years and, you know, she's selling because of personal reasons. So you, you don't know who, who you'll meet and you've got to be a bit of a, I guess, of a chameleon where you can deal with different sorts of people and get on their wavelength and communicate. And I enjoy that very, very much. All right. So it's the, the, the human communication or the human touch you love about working in real estate. The, the human aspect of it. All right. Absolutely. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. So, you, you, I guess you'd you'd have a lot of different stories from different people, and um, it can be a time consuming <laughs> job, is it? Look, um, real estate. I I actually would go as far as saying it's not a job; yeah. it's a lifestyle choice. Okay. If you're a real estate agent, you you are definitely not nine to five. We all know that already, because basically anybody who can afford to buy or sell a house. They are at work between nine and five, most likely. So if you're going to be dealing with that potential client, it's probably going to be after hours or before hours. So you have to really, really love real estate, love what you do, and really make it who you are. If you can't make it who you are, I'm just going to say it straight, you probably won't be a successful real estate agent. Real estate is one of those, um, one of those jobs or one of those careers that can at the same time be one of the most lowest paid positions wow. and at the same time, one of the most highest paid positions in the country. I mean, there are real estate agents making millions of dollars and there are real estate agents making, you know, $38,000 a year. So it does vary a lot. And if you want to be up there, then you really got to make it who you are. So how, how do you, like, how is it that uh, some people are making only 38 and then some people are making millions of dollars is it the area yeah. that you're in or no absolutely not it's just it just varies that much definitely not the area that you're in because people buy and sell wherever they might be you know this area of area it doesn't matter there's still transactions happening um it really comes down to how how well you communicate how hard you work there is there are no shortcuts you're gonna have to get on the street you have to knock on doors you have to make calls you have to meet people it's all about people, like I was saying before. The more people you meet, the more, I guess, the higher your income will be in real estate. But if you make it solely about the income, about the dollars, you're not going to get the client in the first place. So you have to. So this just goes back to making it about people, solving people's problems, and uh, being a trusted advisor for that person, and helping that person, and wanting to help that person first and foremost. And then after that, the dollars will flow if you do a good job at that first. So, the- so it's just. It's Sorry, sorry, yeah, keep go going. So it's just one of those types of of jobs, basically, where the individual in front of you is your sole and only focus, and everything else will come after that. Okay, so it's a bit of a grind there, yeah. It can be, it can be a grind. Sometimes it can be, you know, when you're sitting there in the office at eight thirty at night doing paperwork because you just got back into the office and everyone else is at home relaxed on the couch. Sometimes it can be a grind, but you take the good with, with the bad and you just grind through. Right. Absolutely. Okay. So what does your daily routine normally consist of? It's very varied, but there are some non, non-negotiable non yep. that I have in my day-to-day. Obviously, we'll, we'll try and get into the office at around – 8 a.m. every day, early if we can, between 7.30 and 8, I'd say, on average. Uh, first thing we'll do is obviously reply back to all the emails which we have. So I'll give you like a very clear breakdown of how my yeah. day goes. So get into the office, coffee, emails. Then we'll start our callbacks from the day before. So let's say we had an open floor inspection or something yeah. like this. We'll call everybody back. We'll say, hey, what do you think about the property which you saw uh, last night? Any, any feedback for me to pass on to the vendor, et cetera, and we'll work with those uh, uh, buyers. Then we go straight into prospecting. So we prospect for new business. And how we do that varies. It can be anything from online to you know, good old-fashioned door knocks, cold calls, et cetera. Then after that, we move on to our client appointments. So any appointments which we set the previous day from our prospecting, we'll generally go see in the afternoon. And that can last anywhere from 3 or 4 p.m. onwards to about 8 or 9 o'clock. Just depends on what's happening on that yeah. day. So my day basically consists of being on the phone, 
being face to face and talking to people nonstop from when I wake up to when I'm going to bed. And the more people I talk to, the better I'll do. Okay. So that's generally what it is. So do you get much time for personal time, like for exercising or socializing with <laughs> friends? Well, honestly, no. Oh, wow. We don't have much time for stuff like that. Uh, most of our time is spent on the business and uh, working with clients. Uh, I do like to, to, to train though. So I try and get into, into the gym at least once a day, either in the morning at about 6 a.m., or at night at about 9 or 10 or 11 o'clock. just depends on what's happening wow. that day. And that's kind of like my little outlet. Yeah. So an hour of gym a day is pretty much all I get. And occasionally on a Sunday, if we don't have open for inspections, on the rare days that, that uh, we don't, I love to get out to the pub and have a quiet beer in a beer garden somewhere. That is my one weakness, <laughs> a Carlton draft on a warm uh, day. Everyone loves a beer. <laughs> Um, so what's involved in the process of actually selling a house? Say I brought a house to you and I have a house oh. to sell. What is the process involved with it? Yeah. Well, there are 10 steps to selling a house. Uh, the first one is called each and I'll take care of the other nine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. So uh, basically to sell a house, obviously you have to engage a real estate agent. That real estate agent will then walk you through the steps of selling that property. Every property is different. Yeah. So I, I won't give too much of an in-depth um, analysis of what it takes to sell a property. But the basic steps are engage your real estate yeah. agent, see a couple of them, get them all to walk through the property, get them all to um, price it up for you essentially, uh, get, the, get the feedback from them about what you need to do or any repairs that need to be done or is the house good to go right now. Mm -hmm. After that, they'll, they'll generally refer you to, us, to what's called a conveyancer. Yeah. The conveyancer will then prepare all the legal documents for your property, yeah. um, which you'll need to sell, like contracts and things like that. Um, then the real estate agent will put together a marketing plan for you um, amongst all of this. The, the marketing plan will essentially dictate how they're going to market the property. So as an example, you know, realestate.com.au, domain.com.au, of course. Yeah. Those are kind of like non-negotiables uh, these days you know, print ads, the boards, et cetera. And they'll work through all of that for you. Then they'll place the property for sale. Well, they'll take it to the market officially for you. That real estate agent will then negotiate with all the buyers and the sellers that come through. And of course, try and extract the best price from the market at that time for your property. Then they'll put the, put the deal together for you and get it through the conveyance stage and the finance stage as well. So it, it, it can be time consuming, especially these days through COVID-19. Yeah. I mean, these days, a, 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 a property sold is taken anywhere from, you know, a month to six weeks just to get finance through through the banks because the banks are being very, very tough these days with finance applications. So it just it just really depends on the property and where it is. And what kind of property it so is. has it been a bit of a challenge with the whole COVID-19 uh, pandemic at the moment? Yeah. It, the whole COVID-19 situation has definitely slowed down the property market. So what I mean by that is properties are taking a, li a little bit longer to sell than what they were, you know, two months ago. Having said that, they're still selling for very, very similar prices to what they were selling pre-COVID. I would say it'd be single digits. So, yeah. you know, one, two or three percent difference in pricing. Um, not much at all. Yeah. Uh, but it's just taking longer to get the result. Oh. But the results are still are still there, and they are still very compared with the pre-COVID. So Melbourne is a is a city where the property prices I would say are fairly inelastic. You know, it's a fast growing city. Um, there isn't enough housing yeah. uh, for the people that are here now, and the housing market can withstand quite a lot. Oh, okay. So that's good for me as a real estate agent, of course, and that's good for the people selling. So um. With yourself, pandemic aside, when you're in real estate, right, what are some of the challenges you face yourself when it comes to selling a house? Mm. I guess the biggest challenge which we would face as agents at the moment are the banks. Okay. So vendors still want to sell. Yeah. Buyers still want to buy, of course. Yeah. And the big roadblock which we have right now is the bank's at the moment. So generally, the big fours are very, very tough to get deals through. Like I was saying before, you know, they're taking sometimes six weeks 
to approve somebody's finance. So they're going through everybody's finance with a fine tooth comb. So they're looking at things like, do you have a Netflix subscription? Really? You know, do you have an afterpay bill? Um, do you eat takeaway, you know, a couple of times a week? This is how deep the banks are actually going now. And I understand why they're doing it because, you know, they need to make sure that that the person can repay the loan, yeah. which they're taking out, of course. But it's just been, it's been very challenging. So we've had situations where, you know, deals have fallen through because the banks come through and said, oh, look, this person's got an afterpay debt of $2,000. They can't have a loan. Oh, wow. So that's the harsh, harsh reality of where we're at today. So that, I would say that's probably one of the biggest challenges that, that, that we have right now as agents, for so sure. You, so you believe it's a key asset for a person to basically have a really good credit rating? Oh, you've got to have everything speak and stand before you even walk into those front doors of, the, of uh, one of those banks because uh, they're not being kind right now. That's for I, sure. I always, but that's how it goes. I always thought that, um, you know, with these banks that they never really cared because – if you don't make your payments, they just repossess their house and just resell it and recoup their losses. Look. Is that so? <laughs> yes, exactly. The, their marketing campaigns on TV and print, whatever, internet, would have you believe that they care, but the person that cares about you, well, the, the organization that cares about you the least is the bank. Oh. They do not care. Um, if, if, God forbid, somebody does not pay back their loan, they're going to be in there and they're going to fire sell that property most probably at auction, mm. and whatever they get, they get. If they don't get back what you owe them, too bad, they'll send you a bill. Wow. And unfortunately, that's how, that's how it is. You know, and um, it's important for people not to overextend uh, when how, they're buying property. How easy is it to fault against the bank? Are they, do they give you much leniency or are they brutal? Um, they do, depending on your situation. Mm. They can give you quite a bit of leniency, but that, 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 and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to comment on how much because it just varies depending on the different situation. But from what I've seen, they do give you quite a bit of leniency to pay, but there comes a point where they're going to say, all right, that's enough. Um, and that does happen. That happens more often than people think it, think it happens. It's actually a common thing where the bank will actually come in and repossess. I've seen it. It's never pretty, but it is a harsh reality of life. Okay, so um, when it comes to the property market, uh, there are challenges. Are there any down periods? Like, is there like, are there often times when it's like, um, not worth selling a house? Basically, yeah. Well, look, just I, I wouldn't say so. Um, whenever I, I have a client in front of me, and that client says, "Hey, look, you know, I'm not really." in on selling right now because I believe that the property market's taken a bit of a downturn of you know X, Y, Z percentage. And I'll generally say to that most times anyway, um, I'll generally just say to that uh, person, hey, look, yeah, um, if they're right anyway, I'll say, if they're wrong, I'll say, no, you're wrong. Yeah, if they're yeah. right, I'll say, yeah, you're right. The, the property market has come down by X, Y, Z percentage in this area, but most people anyway, I'll give an example, are buying and selling in the same market. So they might be selling a property which they own in the southeastern suburbs of Melbourne to purchase another property also in the southeastern suburbs of Melbourne. So they'll say, I don't want to sell my house because the, the value has come down by X, Y, Z. I say, yeah, of course it has. It has come down. I'm not going to uh, uh, deny that. Yeah. However, uh, the, the property which you're going to purchase next has also come down by X, Y, Z. So whether the market is up or down, sideways, you know, diagonal, it doesn't really matter for most people because they buy and they sell, yeah. generally even in the same area. So it doesn't really matter. So one of those, that's just one of those things about property which people don't think about. So in, in their thinking, they think, oh, it's come down, I won't sell. I'll sell when it's going yeah. up, when, the, when, when my house value is going to go up. But that's actually one of the worst times to sell. Because let's say, let's say, as an example, the market is going up, you know, 2 3% every month mm. or so. As an example, by the time you sell, settle, get paid, and then you go to buy your next property, yeah. that's gone up even more. Oh, okay. So now you're even worse off. So I would argue that the best time to actually purchase or sell and purchase is in, in, in a declining market. Oh, okay. As counterintuitive as that sounds. Oh, okay. So what, what causes, I don't know, like what causes the market to go up and down? 
Um, what are the general influences in these markets that make them? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I'm not going to comment too much yeah, on yeah. that because that's going to open up a whole can of <laughs> you know macroeconomic issues and questions. Yeah, yeah. But you know what I will say is it, it generally comes down to confidence. Okay. You know how confident are people in the economy? Like what? And you can't really measure confidence with any sort of ac- scientific accuracy. Yeah, yeah. You know you can estimate. Yes, but really, it comes down to how confident are the consumers, the 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 home buyers, in the strength of the economy. That's what it comes down yeah. to, you know, and um, that's what I would put it down to. Okay, you know, I'd be hesitant to talk about anything <laughs> else because we'll we'll just be here forever. Oh, that's all good. <laughs> I've got all the time in the world. But um, yeah. for so for investors, what are some key points they should look at when? Getting into it, absolutely. buying into the market, um, yeah, absolutely. investing. Yeah, this is a very straightforward one. Yeah, it's very, very straightforward. If you're an investor, yeah. um, this is what I would be, I would be uh, looking for, is I would be looking for land. Yeah. When I say land, I don't mean an empty block in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Well, you can do that as well, but for your general mum and dad investor, which is the majority of clients that I deal yeah. with, a property which is sitting on a nice rectangular block mm with no easements or anything like that on the sides or at the back, where, you know, in the future, yeah. um, you could potentially sell that or develop it yourself. Yeah. So God's not, God is not making any more land. Yeah. Uh, what I want to tell people is that the <laughs> house that's on the block, which you're buying, mm. is a depreciating asset mm. most of the time. You know, it's not going up in value, it's going down. What's going up in value is the land value. That's what's really going yeah. up. So I would... You know, as a bit of general advice, I would say if you're looking for a property, your 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 average mum and dad investor um, living in, in the suburbs somewhere, buy a property that has a bit of land. Yeah, nice rectangular. That's pretty much it. That that's the basics. Yeah, of it. Um, well, I notice um a lot of the houses in some areas, uh, they'll have big blocks of land, and what they'll basically be doing is keeping the houses, the pre-existing house on the property. And building like uh, units at the back. at the back, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, that's very, very popular. That's very, very popular for your average mum and dad investor. Mm. Um, it's getting hard to find blocks like that though, because they've all been snapped up over the last decade or so. It's very hard to find. And generally, when you do find them, um, the sellers obviously want a premium for them, of course, oh, okay. because they know the potential for that for that uh, block. But if you can find that, absolutely get all over it on it. Even if you don't build yourself, maybe you know one day when you do sell it on, the next person can can build on there, and you, can, and you yourself can sell some more in the future. But that's 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 definitely something that, that I would do if I was looking. So for. the main tip, Anything. the main tip for any investor is to buy a block, uh, buy a house with a big block of land. So um, whatever happens, you can basically yeah, absolutely. You know, you could knock yeah. it down if you can afford it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. House with land. Sure. Okay, so um, is it easy to flip houses? Like I've heard the term "flip houses" uh, when people. Yeah, yeah, it, it depends. You know how how patient and how handy are you? Um, it just it just really really uh, really really uh, depends. I wouldn't say it's hard mm. because you know for most people who have access to a computer and or their phone and they can open up YouTube. You can find anything mm. on there. I mean, the other day I was looking up uh, myself how to. How to renovate a bathroom and and um, how to do tiling, just because I was interested in what was out there. So you can pretty much do if you're kind of handy, of course you can do it all yourself. Maybe for the bigger jobs like um, you know electrical or plumbing, you might get somebody in. But for simple things like you know plastering, painting, all that kind of stuff, so jobs that you don't need a qualification for, yeah. then yeah, absolutely you can you can definitely do that if you have time. Yeah. That is. But what about if um, I've been I've got friends who have renovated their own houses, okay, uh, with uh, with uh, zero experience, just using YouTube, <laughs> okay. So you can do it, absolutely. So if yeah. you're not handy at all, say, so, um, yeah, you're just not good with a hammer at all. <laughs> if you're not handy at all, don't don't bother. <laughs> if you're not handy at all, do not bother because it's time consuming. It'll take you longer than what you think it'll take you. It'll cost you more than what you think it'll cost. Yeah. Um, so if you only tackle it if you're a handy person, uh, okay. If you're not, then um, leave it leave it to a professional. All right. So, um, as long as uh, you've got some skill with the the tools, it's it's okay to flip houses. But if you got no skills, I would, don't I would even bother. Say, yeah. If you got no skill, don't don't bother. Save yourself the heartache. Fair enough. So, with developers, what are some of the challenges they find? Because I'm sure you come across a lot of 
um, up and coming developers, oh, existing absolutely. developers. What are the challenges yeah. they have? I would say one of the yeah one of the biggest challenges that a developer would probably face, at least in the area where I'm working anyway, is the council. Okay. The council can be brutal on approving plans and permits. You know, they'll knock back plans and permits because the plants are in the wrong spot or you've used the wrong kind of plants. Very silly things like that. So, yes, it's great if you're a developer and you've got the money and all that, but you've, you've really got to be adept and really understand the requirements of your local council or have, you know, have an architect who does understand. And I would say that's, that's probably one of the bigger challenges dealing with, with the council. So if I... For sure. If I bought a block of land and I wanted to build three townhouses, how long would it would I have to allow myself to, from the date that I purchased the property to completion? Oh. Yeah, I would say eighteen months. Wow, probably around eighteen months it would take. So in that eighteen months, you've got to remember that you're probably paying the mortgage in that eighteen months mm -hmm. on the land which you've purchased. Yeah, you'll you'll be paying that off, and you're not and you're probably not going to be getting any income mm -hmm. if there's a property. There already, you might have a tenant in there and they might be, you know, subsidizing some of that cost, maybe. Mm -hmm. But let's just assume that there isn't. So you've got 18 months there trying to get plans and permits through uh, council generally before you can even break ground. Oh, okay. That's, that's, you know, if, if uh, everything goes well. I mean, I have heard of, I have heard of situations where it gets done in 12 months. But if I was going to be doing it myself, I would be saying 18 months just in case. You know, the council knocks anything back or things go wrong with payers and permits and things like that. But it can get quite expensive. How long does it take uh, the council generally to approve plans? Like, for, say I bought the land and then I wanted to build and I got the builders, yeah, they've written, they've drawn up all the uh, plans for it. Um, how long would it yeah. take me to get this process to get them to start building normally with these councils? Yeah. Look, it, it, it does vary a lot. Mm. It does, depending on what you're building, where it is, you know, um, does anybody object in the street to you developing that property? You know, if that happens, that can take e even longer. Do you have to go to VCAT mm. to, you know, overturn a ruling? You know, it really does vary. And I, I don't know if I could comment with any sort of certainty of how long it would take. Yeah. So it just really depends on that particular situation. But it's never as quick as you think it's going to be. Let's just put it that way. And, um, and it, and it never goes as smoothly as you hope it will. And also, facilities in the area, um, like schools, shopping centres, do yeah. they actually influence the price that for you to sell the properties after? Yeah. Do they make a big difference? Absolutely. Massive difference. Absolutely huge difference. You know, being close to amenities, you know, transport, schools, shopping centres, et cetera, if everybody wants that. Okay. So as long as you're not too close, as long as you're not across the road from the train station, <laughs> <laughs> then you said it's definitely it's definitely beneficial to be close by to all those key those key things, those key in infrastructure type things for sure. You know, being close to, to um, like being close to as an example, a primary school, mm. you've got you know a young family moves uh, wants to move in primary schools, you know, five minutes walk or three minutes walk away, something like this. Of, of course, price goes up. So it's it's, it's, it's worth spending those extra dollars if you're to buy a block of land, if you've got all those amenities in the area, is it? Absolutely. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, a property is only worth what the what the market's willing to pay mm. at that particular time. And you know, generally, I found that if you're close to you know those those types of those types of things, then the price is generally higher than it, it would be in the same suburb if you were further away. Oh, okay. Absolutely. So is, is this something for everyone to do? Like, is it is it worth, like, a mum and dad worth getting into property development to make a few extra dollars? That's a hard one to answer. If I have to just give a yes or a no, I would say no. Oh, okay. Um, getting into property development, unless you've got a passion for it and you're willing to put in the time yeah. into learning what you're doing, then I would say don't do it. Okay. Because, yes, you can make money. But you can also very easily lose a lot of money as well. And for your typical mum and dad investors, unless they're really, really keen on something like yeah. that, I would generally counsel them away unless they really got educated about it and they really, really wanted to do it yeah. and they put the effort in. Then I would say a different story. But if you just want to make some money, you're not really that interested, you know, you just want to buy this or buy that and do this, and you're not that keen or that, or that, that invested um, education-wise, and I'd say stay away from the vast majority of property um, development type deals. What would they... For what sure. Would they, sorry, um, keep going. 
No, no. Um, there are a lot of um, companies out there that um, mum and dad investors can go to and invest in like a type of like a syndicate type deal okay. where that that company will put together a property development deal. They'll get a number of people involved to put in on the deal and the company will then develop that site and divvy up the profits amongst whoever, amongst whoever put in. So there are those options out there for mum and dad that don't really know the industry too well but still want to become property developers as such. Um, but I won't name them yeah, because I know quite a few of those guys and they'll get upset and they'll say that I'm favouring this person or that <laughs> no, person. So good. But they are out there and a quick Google search and you can easily what find What would you them. need a Google? Just property investment companies. I'm, I'm sure that'll uh, come up. Google knows everything. Oh, okay. <laughs> you just type that in and it'll come up. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, for sure. How much money do you generally need to start to get involved in one of those companies? Oh, look, it can be anywhere from five grand. Oh, really? That, you know, that 10 little? 10 grand or so. And you'll have a shit. Yeah, that's small. So they've got quite a few people that, you know, pull their resources together, obviously, mm. to, you know, develop something. And obviously, the more you put in, the more you're going to get back at the end. Yeah. So it all, it, it's, all, it's all a percentage of how much you put in originally. But there are quite a few of those companies out there, and they do do quite well. So if any mums and dads were thinking about investing in property, but they weren't too sure about what they were doing, that could be a good a good place to start. So would you say it's a, l- a lucrative opportunity? Can be. Mm. Can be. It can be when the market is strong, absolutely. And uh, it's definitely something that's at, at, it's at least worth looking at if they're interested in that kind of thing. I mean, they don't have to go ahead and sign on the dotted line, but they can still look. Oh, okay. And say they didn't want to do that and they someone wanted to get into property development into it themselves. themselves, what would they need to learn to get involved in it? What they need to learn? Yeah, yeah you were saying before you, they would have to educate themselves yeah. about getting into property development. Yeah, absolutely. What sort of stuff would they need to learn? Mm. Yeah, so basically where, where they would be starting is with the local council. Oh, you know, okay. Uh, finding out generally where they want to purchase the land or, yeah. or the property, um, finding out the restrictions on, on the use of that land for that area because every area is different. Mm. You know, some areas you can build townhouses, some areas you can't. Yeah. Some areas are residential, some areas um, are zoned as industrial. Oh, okay. You know, it just really, really uh, depends on where you are. So finding out exactly what the restrictions are in that area where you want to purchase and then finding out, you know, the build costs as an example. Yeah. Talk to build, find out, you know, what's it going to cost per square meter to build something. Um, how much land do I need to build this amount of units or that amount of townhouses or whatever it is that you want to do. So really educating yourself, you know, on the particular area, uh, what the potential sales price might be at the end, uh, what might it cost you to purchase, you know, how much a plan and permit is going to cost, what's, um, what's the architect going to charge you for his or her services. There's a whole bunch of stuff. Oh, wow. And, you know, it, it takes time. It is takes there a time. course you could do to uh, learn about this sort of stuff, this property development? I'm, I think there is, yeah, yeah. I think there is. Um, so you, I'm sure you can do probably like a short case course or something like okay. that on property development, I'm sure. Mm. Yeah, but I'm, you know, these days you can learn pretty much anything on Google, yeah. can't you? I mean, you can do like, <laughs> like two courses and things like that. So, you know, I think the days of formal education where you go to university you know, you do a Bachelor of Business or whatever it is. I think those days are kind of numbers. Oh, okay. Uh, they're, they're on the tail end. This is, this is what I think personally. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've got a situation now where super, where super huge corporations like, you know, Google and that kind of thing aren't requiring people to have degrees anymore. Oh, okay. You know, 20 years ago, that was unheard of. Now it's very common for somebody to go into Google, not have a formal education and still get a job. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. So I'm, I'm actually, unless you're going to be a doctor, mm or a lawyer or something like that. Obviously, you need formal education to do something like that. But if you're talking things like business and all that kind of stuff or or like entrepreneurial stuff or uh, whatnot, I really think that the days of uh, formal education are pretty much done. By the time I die, it'll be finished. So um, your education and marketing and business that you did before, did it help you out with uh, getting into the real estate industry? Did it make – yeah, did it help you out? I think it did. I just think it did. I – I'm actually going to go out there and say the only thing Mm. that university taught me was how how to fail at thinking for myself and thinking critically. Okay. Didn't teach. It taught me to think a certain way, Mm. 
and not look outside of the box. And that's the real shame because I had always thought when, uh, growing up that university uh, was the way to go. Yeah. But for me, I'm just talking about myself, for me, I, it honestly taught me nothing. It taught me how to memorize a textbook yeah. and regurgitate the content that I read in at the end of the term in a written exam. That's literally it. Everything I've learned, I'm self-taught. So it wasn't really an asset for you in the real estate in- industry, was it? It wasn't an asset for life. Oh, okay. It wasn't an asset, um, unfortunately. And that's just me. I'm, sh- I'm sure there are people out there that are getting value yeah. from it. But I myself, as someone who's quite entrepreneurial, yeah. didn't get anything from it. I've learned more watching YouTube videos. And I wow. hate to say that, but it's true than what I have in formal, in formal education. Yeah, I remember one of the co-creators um, of Reddit said that uh, he was a really smart kid at the time, and he said, these days you don't really need to go to school to learn because you could quite easily pick up a book or like yourself go on the internet and learn what you need to know to achieve what you want Absolutely. to achieve. Absolutely, and, and I think uh, more and more people are, are going down that route Absolutely. I mean, when Google doesn't require you to have a degree anymore, you know that things are changing pretty quickly. So is it easy to get into real estate? I would say yes and no. Okay. It's easy to get in real estate and do um, the bare minimum yeah. and sit at your desk and you know get paid your minimum wage. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. easy. But is it is it easy to get into real estate and become a high performance agent? I would say no, it's not easy. But at the same time, I would also say yes, it is easy because because you enjoy it. Yeah. And when you enjoy something, you no longer view it as work. Yeah. You you enjoy what you do and all of a sudden doing a ten or a twelve hour day it feels like if you were going to your nine to five doing a three hour day. That's what it feels oh, like. Right. Because you enjoy it. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. I remember saying once it was a uh, work a job you like, never work a day in your life. Would you would you say that's your that philosophy? Is so true. Oh, that is so, so, so true. And I never really understood when people said that before, yeah. but now I get it. I completely get it. I mean you could I could go to work on a Sunday. When everyone else is relaxing at, at home and do 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., and I wouldn't even bat an eyelid. It, it just wouldn't affect me because I, I really do love it. I genuinely enjoy it. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, so if you could go back in time, would you have gotten into real estate before going into university? If I could go back in time, I, I have thought about this before. If I could go back in time, you know what? Funny story. Yeah. I can think back to when I think I was I think I was in year eight or year nine or I don't, can't remember I was yeah. young in in high school back then the major search engine on the internet I think it was Ask Jeeves and Alta Vista yeah, I remember Alta Vista the older viewers might know what I'm talking about <laughs> Ask Jeeves and Alta Vista then one day somebody said to me I think I was in the library yeah. using one of the uh, computers somebody said to me why don't you use Google. And I'm like, Google? What's Google? And they're like, oh, it's like a really clear interface. Things load faster. Because back then it was all 56K modem. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. I don't know if like, this might know what that is, but that was slow internet. <laughs> you would open a picture and sit there and wait for it to open. So I thought, Google, that's rubbish. There's there's no links to click on the page like yeah, in Alta yeah, Vista. Yeah. This will never take off. Mm. <laughs> never. Rubbish. But, you know, obviously I was wrong. Google now owns the world, basically, as far as information yeah. goes. So it just goes to show that hindsight is a beautiful thing. But anyway, back back to your, back to your uh, original <laughs> question. If I could go back in time, back mm. then, the first thing I would do uh, is um, I'd probably drop out of school in year 10. Oh, really? I honestly would. I would have dropped out of school in year 10 and I would have gone straight to work. Oh, wow. I would have gone straight to work in real estate as someone's assistant. Ah, okay. And learn from the ground up. So, th- And as I was learning, mm. being paid an income as well, Paid to learn, basically. Oh, yeah. That's what I would have done. had had I known what I know today. Yeah. I would not have pursued my university education at yeah. all. I would not have had a couple of jobs in big uh, corporates. I wouldn't have done that. I would have gone straight into real estate. But hindsight, yeah, you know, no, I get that. Better later. No, that's an interesting recommendation, really. Um, 
become someone's assistant, learn have a mentor basically, and now have, have a mentor. Yeah, and then once you turn eighteen, you can basically do the real estate course and get it, hit the ground running on there with, with some past experience behind you. Of course, of course, um, that is definitely what I do now, uh, and I, I, I actually think that the best learning, mm. the way to learn um, for me is to learn on the job as you're doing something. Yeah. I was never the kind of person to really sit there, look at a textbook and absorb everything and be all knowledgeable and all that kind of stuff. That just wasn't me. Mm. And I'm sure some people out there could probably relate to what I'm yeah. saying, but on the job experience and on the job learning, I think is some of the best learning that you can oh, do. Oh, wow. So um, do you, you obviously have some down days. Um, everyone has ups and downs. Um, what keeps you motivated in this industry? That's a that's actually a very very good question because in real estate it's very easy to lose focus yeah. because unlike a traditional job there's no boss looking over you saying where's this report where's that report why haven't you put that away or whatever it might be wherever it is somebody might work you don't have that so basically you're your own boss so you've got to basically police yourself mm. police your own time and make sure that you're accountable but you have to be accountable to yourself yeah. So that, that can get challenging sometimes. You know, sometimes I might find my, find my brain wandering off and, I'm, you know, I'm starting out on my computer looking up real estate in the area and next minute I'm looking at cats on YouTube for 20 oh, yeah. minutes, you know, falling off tables and stuff like that. So you, you've really got to catch yourself. You know, everyone has kind of like down moments where they're not really that focused and stuff like that. But it's important about, about you know, it's, it's important to reel that back and say, okay, now let's get back on, on onto uh, – onto what I was doing before. But with me, I'm very, very lucky because I work with my brother. Yeah. So his name's Matt. Matt and I both work together both in real estate, so it's our business mm. together. And, you know, if I'm having a bit of a moment where I'm a bit distracted, he'll reel me in or if he is, I'll reel him in. So it's good that we can bounce off each other in that way. Okay. So that's how we kind of keep each check. But it can be um, it can be one of these jobs where you can lose focus, absolutely being your own boss, for sure. So for first time, you know, first time people, like, because you run your own real estate agent, right? Would you recommend them working for someone first, or do you reckon it's just as good yeah. to open up your own real estate, yeah. go out and canvas and yeah. get, you know, houses? What do you yeah. recommend? What did you do? If, um, yeah, so I actually went to work for uh, a large real estate firm, mm -hmm. basically to learn. And I worked there for quite a while before opening up my own business. And I would recommend anyone who's thinking about, getting involved in real estate to do the same. I don't think that somebody should even think about jumping into real estate without prior experience. Well, not on their own anyway. Yeah. Um, it's one of those jobs where it's very complex and there are, and there are a lot of legalities involved and things like that. I'm sure you yeah. know, I'm sure everyone out there knows that you're dealing with, you know, pretty important things here, high, high dollar, high dollar amounts. Yeah. So it's important to have a bit of experience behind you before you even consider going on your own. So if um, somebody was sitting in front of me today and they said, hey, should I get into real estate? I'd say, yeah, look, if you if you know you think you can cut it and absolutely do it, but I think you should get a job at uh, you know one of the big real estate firms and have them teach you everything for a couple of years at least before you step out on your own. Because stepping out on your own in real estate, it's very tough, it's very, very tough. And being on your own as well, um, you also don't have that kind of brand support, okay. which you would have if you were with one of the bigger brands. Um, that brand support is crucial, especially when you're starting out. Um, you know, instead of saying, hi, my name is, you know, John Citizen, can I sell your yeah. house? Most people will say, who are you? Get out of here. But if you say, hey, I'm John Citizen from this big company, mm -hmm. they're more likely to listen to you. So with your real estate agent, have you put a lot of, did you have to put a lot of money into your own marketing? Um, we've been very clever with how we do our marketing. Mm -hmm. um, so we predominantly um, focus most of our advertising time, spend, et cetera, online. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of um, – we steer clear of print and radio, all that kind of stuff. We steer clear of that and we put all – well, most of our spend online because online is where most people are. I mean, let me just grab this. I mean, 90% yeah. of people are on this every single day. Yeah. And it's all about eyeballs. So we want to be where the people are and the people are here. 
So that's where we spend most of our time and our dollars. Yes, we spend quite a bit, but we've been smart about how we do it and we've been able to you know, um, start one of the fastest growing independent uh, real estate agencies um, in the area, basically. So we're doing really, really well now. Yeah. Um, it wasn't always uh, the case, of course, mm. you know, being a new kid on the block. It takes a while until people start to trust you and see your boards up, see that you can get results, yeah. um, see testimonials, other happy customers. And, you know, now we're in a position where we are quite fortunate and we are doing quite well, but it's been a hard road getting there. It, it definitely wasn't straightforward. It wasn't smooth sailing. Like, you know, people think at the path to success is like a straight line like this, but it, it's really not. It was just like here and here and then backwards a little yeah. bit and then forwards and here and here until we, you know, we eventually got to where we are today. Oh, okay. But it's definitely been worth it. I wouldn't have it any other way. We've learned a long, we've learned a lot along the yeah. way, and you know we're uh, we're uh, better for it, most definitely. Do you think you'll ever get into franchising? Um, maybe. I'm not going to say no. Yeah. Um, I'll say maybe. Um, it's something which which we might look into in the future. Yeah. Um, it's definitely on the cards. Probably not 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 you know within the next one or two years, but definitely on on the cards. Yeah. So we. We're definitely going to be looking at that. Um, and uh, it's something that we very well might do. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So um, for first-time home buyers, what are some tips you could recommend for them? First-time home buyers. So first-time home buyers is I would say work out what you can spend first before you even start to look at houses. So work out a budget. Speak to your broker. Speak to your bank, whoever it is, and find out what, what you can spend comfortably. And don't look at the interest rate like something which is fixed because it's not. Yeah. You know, the historical interest rates fluctuate so much up to, you know, what, 17% or something like that in the late 80s, yeah. I think it was. So all, always, always think, you know, can I afford this and can I afford this in the worst case scenario? Mm. If the answer is yes, I can afford this in the worst case scenario, then yes. Then go out and look. Look for a property which has a bit of land, of course, like I keep saying, if you can afford to do that. And don't be don't be trying to buy your forever home for your first yeah. home. Buy something nice, something that you can afford, something close to the the amenities, and something that might even need a little bit of minor work, a bit of cosmetic yeah. stuff. Because generally, uh, most first home buyers are going to be most likely a, a little bit younger. Yeah. You know, they have the time and the energy and all that kind of stuff to do really minor basic things around the house. It might be as simple as cleaning up the garden and painting it. It might be that simple. Oh, okay. You know, they might do a kitchen maybe eventually. So don't be looking for your forever home. Uh, Look for a property which will lead into that. So set yourself up for the future. And a lot of first home buyers have um, a problem with doing that, I found. A lot of first home buyers I'm finding are overextending. Yeah. Um, in, in my market anyway, in my area, I mean, I don't know about other areas, yeah. I'm just talking about my experiences, and they're purchasing properties which are kind of out of their price range, and they're living on a very tight margin. Yeah. So let's say interest rates go up by 1.5%, they're stuck. Uh, okay. You know, like, and that's not you know, unthinkable that they might go up by 1% or 1.5%, yeah. right? So these are the kind of things that I would avoid mm. as a first home buyer. Uh, okay. Yeah. So just buy, buy, buy what you can afford. Uh, and just what's the difference between these brokers and these banks, like these Aussie home loans that you see on the TV? Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. So basically the broker, um, his or her main job is to find you the best loan product yeah. from any financial institution. Okay. So they, they would find you the best loan for you, for your situation, and that loan might not even come from one of the big four banks. It might come from somewhere else. Okay. So I would definitely, definitely um, recommend people to use brokers. Okay. Over walking to one of the big four and saying, "Give me one of your off-the-shelf loan products." We probably, I probably wouldn't do that. I probably would go to the broker, you know, and um, work with them exclusively, and they'll help you find the best loan out there. Because generally, if you, you know, if you walk into one of the big four, you're, you're most of the time, anyway, but they're going to try and stitch you up. Oh, really? Most of the time, you know, you might get lucky. You you, you might get a good, you know, off the shelf loan. Maybe, yeah. you, maybe you're lucky. 
But most of the time, I, I think it's very important to go to a broker who can look around for you. Oh, for sure. So basically, they're shopping around for a good deal for you, and they're shopping around for you. And yeah. What, so, so do around. they just make their money off their initial fees, or is it do they actually get a trailing commission yeah, out look, of you? What's how does that work? Correct. Yeah. Every broker's different. Yeah. Um, I probably couldn't comment because you know um, it just varies that yeah. much. But generally, you're right. Generally, there is some sort of a fee up front for their services. Yeah. It's not that much. Mm. And then generally, there is a bit of a trailing commission on that as well. But even accounting for all of that, um, most of the time anyway, using a broker, you will get a better deal than what you generally would you, should you just walk into one of the big four and say, give me a loan. Wow, well, that's interesting. You always thought you could put your faith in the banks, but um, it doesn't quite seem, <laughs> seem like that, to be honest. Um, the last people I would put my faith in is the banks. Yes. They are horrendous. They might say one thing in their marketing, but uh, when it comes down to it, they're not. So great. they're like sharks in an ocean, yeah? They're like sharks. <laughs> you know, banks have been around for, you know, many, many, many hundreds of years, most of them. You know, they know what they're doing. Yeah. They're at the very top of the food chain. They control everything. Mm. You know, at the end of the day, we have to bow down to them, don't we? <laughs> you know, they, they basically print the money that people use in commerce. Oh, man. So, they are my favorite. That, that's a whole other thing. Let's not get into that. <laughs> yeah, no, I just can't believe how um, they just work, look at the world like zeros and dollars and um, they take one person's money, give it to another person and then before you know it, the yeah. person that's, you know, borrowing money off them is paying twice as much as they're giving back to the actual person that's lending them the money, you know, and all you see is they're you know, their profits on their financial reports just go up and up and up. And, yeah, it's just like... Look, with, the, with the banking system, yeah. I would actually say... Actually, Henry Ford said yeah. this. Henry Ford said, if the average person really understood how the banking system worked, there'd be a revolution by tomorrow morning. <laughs> and he's not... Obviously, he's not yeah, wrong. Yeah. He's a smart man. Um, so, the, you know, the banks... The, the uh, banking system, I think, is extremely corrupt. Yeah. Um, there needs to be something done about it, and I, I hope it can be done yeah, one day. Yeah, hopefully. Um, maybe uh, I'm a big fan of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, so I hope one day that actually overtakes, overtakes the banks and um, you know, puts them on the it back might. leg a bit, and um, maybe they'll become a bit more honest, if you know what I mean. Absolutely. I mean, I love the idea of a decentralized currency like that yeah. because obviously then you can't manipulate it as, as easily as you would otherwise. Yeah. You know, like uh, central banks have a lot of power, more power than the average person thinks they does. Mm. I mean, the central banks are the be all and, and you, like people think that, you know, the prime minister or the president in power, they're not in power. <laughs> you know, the real power comes from the people that print the money that you use yeah. and then charge you interest, they just print it out of thin air. Yeah. That's power. Look, I remember that I was reading an article uh, was it a couple of months ago in India, and you know a whole bunch of people put their money in the bank. You know they thought they thought they had faith in the banks, and the bank was uh, just going down the tube really. And a lot of those people lost a lot of their money, even though they weren't investing it. They were just getting the bank to hold their money, but. The you know the banks had uh, really you know bad practices and in the end uh, the consumer had to pay the price so um, I hope we don't get that here in Australia um, in some of the third world mm. countries and yeah. poorer countries they have the you know they have those risks you know but um, yeah yeah look um did you thank you hope that doesn't happen here yeah hopefully <laughs> look did you thank you very much for your time today um, it was much appreciated with all the information that you able to present to the viewers um, and I hope they can take that on board and you know I hope you made a lot of help for them to make uh, educated decisions getting into the housing market but um, to all the viewers out there if you enjoyed today's video don't forget to subscribe hit the notification bell to hear about future videos and uh, smash like if you enjoyed this uh, video but from here with Didier Babette Thank you very much for your time, Didier. You have a good day, everyone, and enjoy the new. I hope you enjoy the new Coot show. Bye bye. Have a good one. Eyes in the sky, gazing far into the night. I raise my hand.